Welcome. I'm glad you came to understand and respond for another one of our conversations. I really am looking forward to this one. Grab a cup of coffee. Join us for a minute. I love a great mystery story. I love adventure stories. Uh, Lord of the Rings, uh, all the Star Wars episodes, the good ones and the bad ones, um, everything that comes from Harry Potter, every part of that. I have over a thousand movies in my collection. I love adventure movies and stories. But this is my favorite. This one you'll enjoy. If you like trying to figure out something that needs you to put some thought into it, a little Sherlock Holmes or Watson element to it, because I want you to understand, I, if you've listened to any of these, you realize I appreciate the story that John tells us in the Gospel of John. He never calls himself John. Uh, he never signs his name as John. The name John, the name John was put on the gospel from the very beginning. And people have sort of made the connection that this was one of the 12 disciples of Jesus. Um, let me explain it a little differently. I got started on this adventure because I was in seminary during a very important time in the 1970s. There was all this talk about uh, how you really couldn't have too much confidence in the printed word. Uh, there was this uh, group in Germany, uh, the Tübingen School, if you want to know the truth about it, and they were saying that Jesus just was a whole lot different than uh, what was described in the scriptures. He was never made a claim for his own divinity. He was just sort of this nice guy that walked around and preached neat stuff. And he got himself in trouble with the authorities and they killed him. Okay, so end of story. But in the middle of that era, in the middle of that period, when everybody was kind of looking at the, the, the actual written word and going, ah, don't have to pay any attention to that, there was a professor named Hilliard Camp. Now, Hilliard Camp was a very interesting fellow. He was fairly tall. A uh, robust man, never married, um, a ready laugh. He could tell a million jokes just from what was recorded in his head. And he, in fact, he made uh, entertaining uh, for dinner parties and that kind of stuff. We'd have uh, men's fish fries and things, and we'd invite Hilliard Camp to come. And he could spin on for 45 minutes or an hour, just one whole series of wonderful stories and humorous anecdotes and he was a joy to be around. But, hidden inside of that, that seemed almost silly on the outside, when he was playing his game, doing his uh, entertaining, there was a passion for Jesus Christ that burned very brightly. And even inside of that, the core of that came from the Jesus that he learned to love through the story of John. Hilliard Camp at that point was very sick. He was dying of cancer. And the chemotherapy that he was under was not working. And he was suffering. 
Um, he carried a glass of water with him everywhere he went because the chemo and radiation had robbed him of his saliva glands and his mouth was always dry. Made it hard for him to speak. Caused him to have a dry cough. He was struggling. And the seminary came to Hilliard Camp and they said, Hilliard, we know you're having difficulty. We're going to take a lot of the courses away from you that you have in the past taught. He was basically a teacher of, of uh, church history. Mm -hmm. He was good at that. But they said, Hilliard, you choose one course, one study that you would like to teach. And you just teach that one course and you will be perfectly satisfied, will be perfectly satisfied as the seminary. He said, well, that doesn't have any, even any question. The course I want to teach is a study on the Gospel of John. It was a decision made so late, there could hardly even be a way to get it publicized that Hilliard Camp was going to teach a semester on the Gospel of John. So I think there were only four of us that signed up. I was the first one. I wanted to learn from Hilliard Camp what he had spent a lifetime getting a hold of and what he shared with us in that semester. And it was a difficult semester for all of us. Uh, I had overloaded. I, in order to get his class, I took a full load plus his class. It was a tough semester. But I wouldn't have missed that time with him. Within a couple of weeks of the end of the class, I'll give you the end of the story first. Within a couple of weeks of the end of the class, the chemotherapy was really causing him a lot of problems. And so facing the very imminent end of his life, he got on a flight and flew to Tijuana, Mexico, and there was a treatment in Tijuana, not approved by this government, where they crushed up apricot pits and gave it to cancer patients. It's a last ditch effort to try and stop the cancer's advance. He died down there in Tijuana and uh, never was able to finish the treatments and they sent his body back. But we had a semester together and he loved the Gospel of John. Now, I'm going to start with that because you have to understand John was the one who told the story differently from everybody else. Differently. People have mistrusted it because it doesn't sound like the other three Gospels. And I can understand that. But if you get to the core of it, if you investigate and listen to what the core of it is, you'll realize the reason it sounds different is he was coming at it from a whole different place. He listened to the story. He listened to the events of his life and saw it through a different lens. Now I have said that he was a lawyer. I have made the claim that Jerusalem was his home, uh, that he was comfortable in just about every setting in Jerusalem, but I want to walk with you if I can. At a very strange spot, I would like to start in the 19th chapter of the story of John. And I want to start with verse 28, because if you're not a Bible scholar, you don't know where all these stories are, but the story of John is the story of Jesus. And at the end of Jesus' life, he's hanging on the cross, and he is just about ready to expire. And then here we hear this part of the story. Later, 
Knowing that all was now completed and that the scriptures would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar, that's spoiled wine, for those of you who don't realize that when wine goes bad, it turns into a vinegar solution, so it stops being a pleasant tasting liquid to a very vulgar tasting liquid. It's rotted wine. I mean, you can use it in cooking and things, but it's not something you want to drink. And they put a sponge on a stalk of a hyssop plant. Now, hyssop is, uh, uh, you don't see it in scripture too often, but it is also referred to in the story of the escape of the Israelite people out of bondage in Egypt. Uh, interesting that they would put those two pieces together because Jesus is being crucified on the day of preparation where the little lambs were being sacrificed, the blood was being drained into a bowl, and a hyssop plant, a, a, a bushy kind of a bush, would be dipped down into that uh, blood and would be spread on the doorpost and the sides, a header of the door, uh, as a symbol of the Passover. So they took a hyssop plant and they stuck it down in the vinegar and they hung it, stuck it up to him, and as he had finished it and lifted it up to Jesus' lips, and when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Uh, now, in that day of preparation, that's the pre preparation for the Passover celebration the next day, the next day was to be the special Sabbath. Sabbath and the Passover came together uh, at sundown on that uh, Friday evening. That was the change to the next day, and it was going to be the Sabbath. Because the Jews did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken, that would hurry up the death, and the bodies taken down so they wouldn't be hanging on the cross, on the three crosses, over the night and over the Sabbath. The soldiers, therefore, came and broke the legs of the first man, that's one of the thieves, that had been crucified with Jesus, and then the other thief on the other side. But when they came to Jesus, they found that he was already dead. So they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear. Now that would have been over here on the right-hand side of the torso, your, your right-hand side. They came, up, came in, because of the lower level of the, the soldier, they came in with a spear just under the bottom rib, and they pierced up through his chest cavity, and they cut through a lung and pierced the heart. Okay. They pierced his side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The blood and water had accumulated in the chest cavity because of the stress, and as soon as that piercing was done, all the accumulated blood and uh, fluid that had built up around the heart and around the lung uh, was released, and it ran out through the wound in his side. Here's the thing. Here's, here's the key right here. The man who saw it has given testimony. And his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth. And he testifies so that you may also believe. These things happen so the scriptures to be fulfilled and not one of his bones be broken. And another scripture says they will look on the one they have pierced. Now, Here's the key. Not one time, not two times, not even three times, but John, referring to himself as the beloved disciple, says, I am telling only what I have seen, only what I have heard. If you wanted to say it more graphically, he said, I am the one who was standing so close when it happened, I got splashed with some of his blood. Now, he didn't say it that way. 
but he was standing at the foot of the cross. He watched what was happening and saw what was done. Now, if you tell me that that's made up stories, if you tell me that somebody wrote this, like the people in the Tubigan school back in the 70s, remember, right? I told you that's where we started. It was just made up stuff. You might as well throw the book away. You might as well throw the book away because if you don't believe a first-hand testimony who wrote it down as it happened, who put his stamp and seal upon it and said, I have seen it. I know this is the way it happened. I was there. I had the sights. I had the sounds. I had the smells. Everything. I saw it. I was there. Now the reason why, you have to go backwards a second. You have to understand there's a very good reason why people don't want to believe it. Because a person would have to be almost superhuman to be able to be in all the places that John said he was to hear all the things that he heard said that he knew was going on. It seems almost impossible. He knew too many people. He was a part of a society that we have always believed was so completely opposed to the ministry of Jesus. He was a part of the inner circle of the high priestly family in Jerusalem. He was, if not a son, maybe a nephew or a very, very close relative of the high priest. That gave him an inside track on everything else that was happening around Jesus. Let's just move through the story and then we'll go backwards through and we'll see how this whole thing fits together because you're going to start asking some questions like, he said he saw everything happen. Okay, as soon as this is done, now this is verse 38 of chapter 19. Later, Joseph of Arimathea. Now you have to understand, the Gospel of John is the only one that actually calls people in the Sanhedrin council by name. Nobody else knows the inner circle of the big decision makers except John. And he doesn't have any problem at all saying it was Joseph of Arimathea that went to Pilate and asked to take his body down. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus. Wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait a minute. This is Joseph of Arimathea. He's an elderly guy. He's a biblical scholar. He's a rabbi of the highest order. This is a man who sits on the Sanhedrin council. And John knows him so well. He has talked with him in private. He has listened to the thoughts and the feelings of Joseph of Arimathea. People will tell you that this book is written by a fisherman that followed Jesus from the area around Galilee, the Lake of Galilee. He wouldn't have known Jer Joseph of Arimathea. He couldn't have. And then to say Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly he feared the Jews, and so he went to Pilate to get permission to take him down. He was accompanied by Nicodemus. This is the third reference to another one of the most senior members of the Sanhedrin Council. Nicodemus is mentioned in the third chapter of John, and yet he wanted to come and 
talk with this man Jesus. And in the middle of the story, uh, the Sanhedrin council is getting more and more upset that Jesus is becoming very popular. It's Nicodemus who's mentioned again in one of the Sanhedrin council meetings. Now, you have to understand, if it doesn't happen, if, if, if it shows up in the story of the book of John, he was there in that meeting. He was in the Sanhedrin council chambers listening to the discussion and reports that Nicodemus took a tremendous amount of abuse because he simply said, we ought to give him a chance to explain himself. That's all he said. And suddenly he was under derision. He was being chastised. He was being criticized. He was being humiliated. All right. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, a man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. This is important. Listen carefully. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes. These were burial anointments. These were burial customs of that time. When people were buried, they, their bodies were anointed, their, their, uh, the bodies were cleansed, cleaned, uh, made, um, at least cleaned up and prepared for burial. And they were anointed with these oils and with these uh, sweet fragrances. Nicodemus, it says, brought 75 pounds. 75 pounds. Now, if you said to yourself, well, let me see. Um... His body was anointed, okay. Maybe they had a bottle. Maybe they had a container. Maybe they had a, a bag they brought things in. No. They brought enough to fill a feed sack. A feed sack. This was the anointing that only the most wealthy and the most mm -hmm. famous of Jewish people would have had this sort of a gift at their burial, buried with them. Jesus got a royal burial by two of the Sanhedrin council who were his followers and disciples in a secret way. And the two of them wrapped up the body of Jesus with the spices in strips of linen. That was in accordance to the burial custom, Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had been laid. And because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Now I want you to understand. Just stop for a second. How do we know these things actually happened? Was it published in the newspaper? Did people hear it over the news? No. There wasn't even a crowd around this. The event ended. I'm going to say this differently. There was a huge crowd when Jesus was alive when it was pretty evident that he had no longer anything left to say, and he was dead. The crowds disappeared like a vapor. Why? Because it was the day of preparation. 
they had things they had to do because as soon as the sun went down, they were going to be locked up in their houses for a day, in the Sabbath day, in the Passover day. They weren't going to be out moving around. You couldn't go to the store. The only time you could go to the store is on that Friday afternoon at about the same time that Jesus was dying. Nicodemus went to the market, got the aloes, got the myrrh, got the strips of cloth, got the face cloth that was going to go over Jesus' head and, and, and around his face, and brought it to the tomb as the last thing that anybody could do before the Sabbath day. And he and Joseph of Arimathea, listen carefully to this because this, it's hard to, it's hard to feel the same feelings that they were going through at that moment. These are deeply respected men, very high in authority on the Sanhedrin Council. They would do anything to celebrate the Passover because it was a very special celebration. And yet they defiled themselves and forbid themselves from being able to partake in the Passover in order to take care of Jesus. They could not touch a deceased person, a dead body, and then celebrate the Passover the next day. They defiled themselves, made themselves unclean. It would take days to go through the ritual of purification to become clean again. Not for some stranger, not for a family member, not for a, a person who just happened to be passing through town who didn't even live in Jerusalem. They sacrificed it as though it was their own kin, their own blood that had died. They loved Jesus. Let me understand this. They loved Jesus. They had no right to love Jesus. They had no support for loving Jesus. They were going to be ridiculed for loving Jesus. But standing right next to them was a very young man who had been following Jesus for three years. He was a young man who had complete access to the temple, to the Sanhedrin council, just like they did. He had complete access to all the discussions, no matter how high up the discussions. The high priest, Caiaphas was the high priest, Ananias Annas was the was the highest of all the priests, but he didn't have the high priest role that year. These were the key people in Jewish society in Jerusalem at the temple. And they had no problem walking into any conversation in any room. They were disciples of Jesus. They could walk out with Jesus to the very Garden of Gethsemane. They could go out there, he could go with them as they traveled out there, and Jesus was praying. It was, it was shocking. When the guards and the soldiers showed up to arrest Jesus, John tells us that as soon as Jesus announced that it was him standing, it, it's me, I'm, I'm here, who do you want? We want Jesus. It's me. Here it is. That the soldiers fell back and dropped down on the ground. A symbol of respect. 
fear, admiration. They had tried to arrest him over and over and over again and failed every time. They failed every single time. He simply vanished as he would move through the crowd and disappear from them, and they couldn't get their hands on him. I'm sure they wondered, what's he going to do this time to get away from us? No, Jesus said, here, I'm, I'm here, come on. If it's me that you want, don't, don't worry about the rest of these folks that are here. Just, just let them go ahead and go. About that time, Peter comes up, and he's decided, you know, I promised I wasn't going to let them take him, and so he grabs the one of the two swords that they had, and he starts lunging into the crowd of, of people that are there to arrest Jesus, and in his haste, he just makes a big old slap with one of those big wide swords they had, and he cuts off back to the right ear of a young boy, a lad. But not just any boy. He happens to work in the high priest's house. Alright? He came along to find out what was happening. He wasn't a soldier. He wasn't a guard. He wasn't anybody of authority. He was just a kid who was curious and walking along to see what was going to happen. And suddenly, as he's getting up close to see what's happening, he happens to be in the place where Peter's sword comes down and takes off his ear. John even knows his name. His name is Malchus. And he was a friend of John. They drew back and fell on the ground. Jesus of Nazareth, we're looking for you. Malchus, the, the high priest's servant. You have to spend some time in the high priest's house to be familiar with who his servants are. Okay, so Jesus reaches over puts Malchus' ear back in place and heals it back as though it had never been touched with the sword. That was his last miraculous sign. He didn't use his power to disappear. He used his power to restore a young man that would have been disfigured for life. John walks along with the group as they head back across the city and they climb the steep hill back up toward Caiaphas's house. He reports that they took Jesus first to Annas's house, his chamber, and they're going to interview him there. But there's a problem. Peter is walking along. Peter's one of the fishermen disciples from Galilee, one of the twelve that Jesus had selected as his inner circle. Uh, John never claims to be one of those twelve. He, he calls them the twelve and never makes himself a member of that group, although he was a follower of Jesus. So he follows along with this crowd of soldiers. When they get to Annas' house, they take Jesus in through the courtyard toward Caiaphas. The, the, those houses of all those very powerful people are are sort of interconnected up there on the top of the hill uh, overlooking the, the, the temple compound itself. Uh, they're the wealthiest homes in town, so they're very large structures and they're sort of connected with courtyards. Because they had people coming and going all the time. It was like, this is a, a very busy place. It's so busy it has room enough for the Sanhedrin Council to meet in there that night. There's even a prison in the lower chambers underneath the house. So it's, it's quite a structure. Peter gets stuck at the gate to the courtyard. Can't follow John into the courtyard to see what's happening. It's here that the story gets very interesting. John, 
seeing that Peter is stuck at the door, goes back through the courtyard and talks to the young gal that's watching the gate and kind of checking the credentials of those who are there. I mean, she knows the household well enough that she knows who can be in there and who can't. She knows by reading the clothing. If you were in the Sanhedrin Council, you wore a certain uniform. I mean, they were well recognized on every street corner. You could tell which ones had the authority and which ones didn't. Peter is wearing a fisherman's robe, a, a, an outfit from Galilee. He just stood out like a stranger. He allowed to come into the courtyard of the high priest house. He may have even been a threat. After all, it was the group from Galilee that seemed to be the most passionate followers of Jesus. Well, John came out and he says, look, I know he doesn't look like us. I know he's not one of the, uh, but you, you can trust him. He's with me. He's with me. And so he is allowed to come into the courtyard of Caiaphas' house. It's there that Peter finds himself in the most impossible, imaginable circumstances. He's surrounded by the enemy. He's surrounded by people that would love to execute him right there on the spot. His life is in mortal danger just standing there, but his curiosity of wanting to see what's happening to Jesus overcomes his ability, his, his, his normal reaction to try and run away. And so he's stuck in this terrible bind, internal conflict of what's happening. You see, he wants to be there with Jesus. But there's danger on every side. Even the third time that he's confronted, it was tough. It was really, really tough. Who asks him if he knows Jesus? <laughs> it happens to be a relative of Malachus who had had his ear cut off by Peter in the garden. Peter may have even recognized him, may have actually seen him standing in the group of soldiers and people that carrying torches trying to arrest Jesus. This man recognizes him as one of the followers of Jesus that they saw just minutes ago in the garden. I recognize you. It's then that Peter denies Jesus for the third time to save his own skin. No, John was there in the high priest's house validating Peter. He was there in the fortress San Antonio when the Jews took Jesus to Pilate to have him convicted. John was there when Pilate called Jesus into his inside chamber. Now, the, the, the high priest and, and, you know, Caiaphas and Annas didn't want to go into Pilate's house, into his chambers, because that would have defiled them for the Passover. This young man, John, did not worry about that kind of stuff. He was wanting to be with Jesus. So he walked in with Jesus into Pilate's inner chambers and listened to the two or three times they had dialogues to try and figure out who this Jesus is and to try and free him from the grip that the Jews, Jewish leaders had put him under. John could go anywhere. John had his own home. He was the host at the house where Jesus had the Last Supper with his disciples. Peter was far enough away 
even though Peter was one of the inner circle, he was not the beloved disciple. You have to understand, Jesus had many, many followers in Jerusalem. We just talked about Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. But you have to understand, the people who loved him most dearly in the story of Mary and Martha and Lazarus are Jerusalem people. They lived in Bethany, but that was just across the way. He had many, many followers in Jerusalem that were not a part of his 12 disciples that followed him through Galilee. He had been to Jerusalem many times and taught in many, many interesting ways and done many miracles in Jerusalem. He was a well-known leader, prophet, spokesman, teacher, rabbi, in Jerusalem. There's a story that's told as Jesus was getting ready for the Passover that last night of his life. He told the disciples, the, the part of the twelve, to prepare the room where they were going to celebrate that meal together. He said, I want you to go into town and in the bustle of the marketplace and all the things going on, you're going to find a man carrying a pitcher of water on his shoulder. And you ask him where he's going and if you can follow him and you can make the preparations there with him for the room we're going to use to celebrate the Passover. Most people just read that, just so many words, a guy with a jug, you know, a guy with a jar on his shoulder, he's, he's walking, walking through a crowded street, and it just happens that these guys happen to be walking through at the same time, and they ask him where he's going. No. It was an appointment. You see, in the high priest family, they had very, very few female helpers, servants, aides. And they were put in a distance away from the center of the activity of the household. They didn't have the primary role like they have today in making the preparations for the meal and for the celebration. Why? Because in the time of Jesus, the Levites, the family that were the ones who served in the temple, who were the family of the high priest, that were in the tribe of the high priests, were told that they had to stay clean, ceremonially and ritually clean, in order to be able to have the celebrations and the worship service and in the, involved in the temple service. And so they were fastidious about all the rules it took to make sure that they were never ever touched, physically touched, by a woman in the preparation for the celebration. They weren't allowed to carry the water because the water would become unclean if they drew it out and they dipped it out. They were not allowed to prepare the meal because it had to be of the Levites who were the male Levites that prepared the meal and did the serving because people who had served in the temple were not to be served by the ladies. It was a very different society than we feel today, but it was pounded home to them every single day of their lives what was allowable and what was not allowable. When they wanted to be in fellowship with their wives, they were off of the service of the temple. They went home on leave. They had their private family time, but then they had to go through the ritual cleansing to be able to be prepared to serve in the temple again. It was not that they weren't married or that marriage was somehow bad, but they had to go through the preparation times that were required. So anytime there was a special celebration, 
like the Passover meal, for the Levites, it had to be prepared by the men. So when the disciples following Jesus saw a man with a jug on his head, on his shoulder or on his head, they knew this was a man who was going to a high priest's house. They were going to John's house because the man who owned the house, being the host of the celebration, always sat next to the guest of honor, Jesus being the guest of honor. Peter, sitting some distance away, even though he was one of the twelve, did not get to sit next to Jesus because in that day, the man who owned the house, who was the host for the meal, who had prepared everything, being a priest, got to sit next to Jesus. At one point, Peter kind of motions to John and says, ask Jesus who it was he said is going to betray him. It says at that point that John... Okay, this is in uh, John 13, verses 23. I'm going to start at 21. After this, he said, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, I tell you the truth, one of you is going to betray me. <laughs> you just listen to the words here. His disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which of them he meant. One of us is going to betray you? One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him in the host's position. Simon Peter motioned to this disciple and said, Ask him who he means, which one he means. Being so close to Jesus, the beloved disciple leaned over and put his head on Jesus' shoulder and whispered, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It's the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it into the dish. And at that point, he dipped it into the dish and he gave it to Judas Iscariot. Now, I know I've rambled on about this quite a long while. I think what I'd like to do is give you some clarity. It was the beloved disciple who was standing at the cross, certainly not any place where a disciple of Jesus would be safe if he wasn't protected by the house of the high priest he was standing at the foot of the cross in a hostile territory. The Romans were in charge of the crucifixion, but it was being done at the insistence of the Jewish temple authorities. They were going to arrest anybody that looked like they might be followers of Jesus from Galilee. It certainly would be a, a threat I mean, at the execution of Jesus, those of his followers who thought they might still make some kind of a stand might be coming up to uh, try and rescue him or something. So the, the, the soldiers were on guard. They were not going to let anybody in there that wasn't supposed to be there. They let the family, they let Mary and her sister and, and Mary Magdalene there at the foot of the cross also, but they weren't a threat. They were family and they were grieving. Um, they were close. And there stood John, the one whom Jesus... the one that Jesus loved. And from the cross, Jesus looked down. He said, woman, take a look. He is now your son. 
son. She is now your mother. And from that day on, Mary, the mother of Jesus, became a member of the house of John the Elder. John the Elder was a very, very close companion of John, the two sons of Zebedee, James and John, part of the inner circle of Jesus, 12 disciples. And they spent most of their lives in Ephesus with Mary. She lived to be very elderly. And you say, Bob, how do you know that? How do you understand that? I want you to take you to Acts, the fourth chapter. In the fourth chapter of the book of Acts, the writer is Luke, follower of Paul. And I'm going to read this to you because sometimes when we read it, the names just sort of, our eyes glass over because we don't recognize, we don't have a picture in our heads of who these are. So we can't say, okay, here's what Peter looks like, this is what James looks like, this is what John looks like, this is what other ones look like. They just, their names on a page and we don't really pay much attention. Let me read first verse of chapter 4. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John. Peter, we understand that one pretty clear. He's the only one named Peter. And John is the sons of Zebedee, the James and John that were a part of the twelve. And while they were speaking to the people in the temple, they were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. They had seen Jesus resurrected from the dead. They'd heard Jesus talk about the resurrection from the dead that was coming. And so they were teaching just what they had heard. So the guards seized Peter and John, that's the sons of Zebedee, James and John, along with Peter and Andrew. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. Now that happens to be the jail that is underneath the house of Caiaphas. They were confined under the house of the high priest. I stood in that jail. I watched where they tied these guys up to the wall, and I, you know, the, the little bench that they sat on, it's still there. The, they were in jail in the lower chambers of Caiaphas's house. But many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000 people. Those were open followers of Jesus after the resurrection. Listen to this now. This is verse number 5 of chapter 4 of, of Acts. The next day, the rulers, all right, the rulers, meaning the members of the Sanhedrin council, the ones who had the authority that were like the Supreme Court of our country, except they were in charge of the Jewish law and the Jewish rule. So they were the rulers and the elders, all right? They were called elders because they were proficient in every way on the study of God's word, the Torah and the Talmud, but they were not a part of the Sanhedrin council. And the teachers of the law, the teachers of the law were the rabbis that basically were the, the moderating influence. If anybody had a dispute, they would bring it to the rabbis, and the rabbis would sort it out. But if they couldn't do it, it would go to the rulers. And if the rulers couldn't do it, it would go to one of the, uh, I mean, go, go to the elders that would go to the rulers in Sanhedrin. They met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there, and so was Caiaphas. But it doesn't stop there. Annas was there. Caiaphas was there. But listen to the names. Also there, John and Alexander, and the other men of the high priest's family. There is a John recorded in the book of Acts who is a member of the high priest's family who was routinely at these meetings 
and at these hearings and at these trials. John and Alexander are mentioned specifically in the sixth verse of chapter 4, and the other men, unnamed men, of the high priest family. They were named because they were already recognizable people. They were named because they, the readers of this would say, yeah, we know John. He's John and Alexander. We know them. They had Peter and John. Don't get confused. Peter and John are the two that were arrested the previous day. J Peter, James, and John, all right? They were followers of Jesus, but a part of the twelve. They had been in prison overnight. They brought Peter and John before them and began to question them. By what power or name do you do this? I'm going to read to you just so that you hear the story. Then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called on account today for the act of kindness shown to a crippled man and are asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. He is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the capstone. It's a quote from scripture. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. There is no other name than the one who said, I am. Before Abraham, I am. I was with God at the beginning. I was in charge of creation. I was given the job of bringing the good news to earth. I showed you the way. Here's the next phrase. When they saw the courage of Peter and John, Peter, James, and John of the Twelve, Peter, James, and John, and realized they were unschooled, unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, and there was nothing they could say, so they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin, and then conferring together, what are we going to do with these men? They asked, Everybody living in Jerusalem knows that they have what they have done this, in this outstanding miracle, and we cannot deny it. So to stop this thing from spreading any farther among the people, we must warn these men to speak no longer to anyone in this name, meaning of Jesus of Nazareth. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John, that's Peter, James, and John of the Twelve, replied, Judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. And after further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. Now I want to mention this to you because they made special note of the fact that Peter and John of the Twelve were unschooled and ordinary men. They didn't speak like college professors. They didn't argue like a rabbi. They didn't even understand that kind of talk. They were simple people with a simple message. 
we were with Jesus, we saw who he was, we saw what he did, we saw what you did to him, we saw what God did to bring him back to life. We have to tell the truth about what we saw. Now listen, in that circle, there was a man, an elder, not one of the ruling Sanhedrin council, named John, who was in the high priest family, who understood the simple power of a personal testimony. We have to tell people what we have seen and heard. You can listen to people debate whether or not to believe the miracles in John. You can listen to people debate whether or not those grand words at the beginning in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And you can say, that don't sound like no fisherman to me. That's right. In God's miraculous plan, there were elderly men who had accepted Jesus as the Messiah and destroyed their lives by lowering his body to the ground, putting 75 pounds of aloes and ointments on him and burying him in their own tomb, Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. There were people who went out of their way to see and hear and be in every discussion. Who knew what the discussions were and had complete understanding of what the issues really were. God had prepared a man to be of exactly the right age, young enough not to be held accountable for following Jesus and believing in him, thinking it was just something he'd grow out of as he learned uh, about the charlatans and the tricksters out there. Old enough to be on his own, make his own decisions of how he was going to spend his time and where he was going to invest his energy. Enough resources that he could live in a house in Jerusalem right along the same street as his family with the connections to be able to go any place and see anywhere he wanted to see. There wasn't a closet in town he couldn't stick his nose in if he wanted to. And who had a deep burning passion. A love that went beyond what we can define in our normal everyday terms about how deeply he loved Jesus and how deeply Jesus loved him. How could the beloved disciple refuse to tell the story? How could the beloved disciple keep it to himself? How could the beloved disciple tell it wrong? How could the disciple who loved Jesus as his own flesh and blood tell lies about what he saw and poison the truth about what actually happened. If one person, if even one person came out and said, John, you are a liar. His testimony would have been ruined. But he didn't. And his testimony 
stands for over 2,000 years. Pay attention to it. Listen to it.